Let's turn now to the substance of the forum, and that is to ask the question, how are the Great Lakes doing? Uh, our first presentation sets the stage for the forum by telling us how the Great Lakes are doing based on past and present information. As I mentioned before, it's at least my hope that this kind of information can help you ask your own questions about the past and present conditions and what they may suggest for future conditions so that we can fulfill, we the governments can fulfill, the agreement's imperatives on prevention and precaution. As many of you know, the two governments in this latest version of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement took big steps to thinking even further out and providing the impetus for uh, thinking about the future. This is our chance to help do that. This is the first of two presentations this morning, and if you have questions, uh, please, I'm gonna ask you to please wait until the question and answer session that will take place after the second session, se second presentation uh, at 11.30. And for those of you watching remotely, you can also comment. I'm gonna remind uh, you of this several times versus, uh, on the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement email addresses or directly to uh, the IJC. I know we will be flashing those email addresses uh, throughout the conference. At this point, please join me in welcoming Nancy Stadler-Salt, the Great Lakes Program Coordinator for Environment and Climate Change Canada, and Jackie Adams, environmental scientist with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, to help lead us through the discussion about how the Great Lakes are doing. podium set up for a righty, not a lefty, so have to bear with me. Uh, good morning and thank you. Um, it's, uh, I'm Nancy stadler salt by the way, and uh, to my right is Jackie Adams, uh, my U.S. counterpart and friend. Uh, we are honored to be the kickoff uh, presentation at the public forum, uh, and uh, hopefully we will be telling a companion story to what Lieutenant Governor Dodswell's story was. This is the science story. The Great Lakes ecosystem is large and complex, and there is an amazing amount of information available about it. In this presentation, we will highlight some of the science and knit it together into packages. At the end, you will hear that the overall conditions of the Great Lakes are fair and unchanging. And along the way, you will learn at how we arrived at this assessment. So to start with, we'll give you a brief overview of the work involved so you have an understanding of the rigor of the process as well as confidence in the results. The science annex of the 2012 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement commits the governments of Canada and the United States to assess the Great Lakes ecosystem using a suite of comprehensive science-based indicators. There are nine indicators used to measure progress towards achieving the nine general objectives of the agreement. These indicators are also used to anticipate emerging threats. Using these indicators, the governments will issue State of the Great Lakes reports every three years to describe the conditions and trends of the ecosystem. An indicator is a piece of evidence or a signal that tells us something about a condition. It is a tool that provides information about the state of large systems such as the environment, the economy, the weather, or even human health. It gives us a clue about the bigger picture by looking at a small piece of the puzzle. To be really useful, we need indicators to give us information about trends over time. Is our blood pressure higher or lower than it was the last time we visited the doctor? The indicators that will be presented today have evolved over many years. Most recently, they have been reviewed and revised in order to be able to report against the 2012 agreement. So having an indicator is important, but what are we assessing it against? The doctor knows that normal blood pressure falls within a certain range. A blood pressure of 120 over 80 generally means the patient is at lower risk for heart disease. Similarly, the indicators used to report on the state of the Great Lakes assess status and trends. 
For most of the indicators, the status assessments used are good, fair, or poor. These assessments are made against an objective, if one is available, or by using the scientific judgment of Great Lakes experts. The trends are generally assessed as improving, unchanging, or deteriorating. Knowing the trends allows us to determine if the ecosystem conditions are getting better or if conditions are getting worse. In some cases, we don't have enough information to make a status or trend assessment, and in those instances, we use undetermined. The State of the Great Lakes assessment includes the most current data available, with some indicators including data up to 2015. In 2014, the parties selected the indicators and supporting sub-indicators to be used for State of the Great Lakes reporting. Nearly 200 authors and contributors prepared 44 sub-indicator reports through 2015 and 16. A series of technical review webinars held in February and March of this year ensured the scientific integrity and accuracy of the draft assessments. Over 160 experts participated in these webinars. The information was collated and synthesized into an overall assessment. And here we are today at the Great Lakes Public Forum to present a summary of this information. The last step in the cycle is the preparation and release of the State of the Great Lakes reports. These will be available on binational.net some point uh, early 2017. So the process involves the collaboration of many, many partners to develop and prepare a robust assessment complete with the support of the Great Lakes scientific community. The nine indicators we use to assess the state of the Great Lakes cover a wide variety of ecosystem components and issues. The nine indicators include watershed impacts and climate trends, habitat and species, invasive species, nutrients and algae, groundwater, toxic chemicals, contaminants in edible fish, drinking water, and beaches. So this slide summarizes how the general objectives of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and the indicators are linked. There are 44 sub-indicators to help support the assessments of the nine indicators. Today we are going to highlight just a few of the sub-indicators to give you a sense of how we arrived at the assessment for each indicator. So let's get started. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement general objective states that the waters of the Great Lakes should be free from other substances, materials, or conditions that may negatively impact the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the waters of the Great Lakes. In order to report on the progress against this water quality agreement general objective, we use an indicator called watershed impacts and climate trends. We will focus first on climate trends and highlight some of the sub-indicators because climate has an impact on all parts of the ecosystem and shapes the relationships between non-living and living components. A changing climate is a condition that may negatively impact the waters of the Great Lakes. The climate trends sub-indicators do not have status assessments as there are no objectives to assess the conditions against in the ecosystem. For example, the ecosystem has adapted to and needs both high and low water levels and neither can be assessed as good or poor. Climate trends are simply assessed as increasing, unchanging, or decreasing over a defined period of time. Climate-based changes can impact the ecosystem health of the Great Lakes Basin. They can facilitate many potential changes, including the northward migration of invasive species and altering habitat in a way that favors some invaders over natives. A changing climate may also result in changes in forest composition, changes in the amount and type of coastal wetlands, and may lead to potential increases in runoff and nutrient loads, along with many other impacts. The take home message is that the lakes are responding to climate change and these changes will have an impact on other parts of the ecosystem. So now let's take a look at what the science from the sub indicators is telling us. Starting with precipitation, five of the top 10 years showing the most precipitation have occurred since 2000 
as compared to a baseline period. In the next century, annual precipitation is expected to increase by up to 20% across the Great Lakes Basin. Lake effect precipitation is expected to increase due to decreasing ice cover on the lakes. The form of precipitation is also expected to change with more winter precipitation falling as rain or freezing rain and less as snow. The overall trend for the precipitation sub-indicator is increasing. This means on average, we're generally seeing more precipitation each year than we did in the past. Moving to water temperatures. Based on open lake surface water temper me temperature measurements, summer water temperatures are increasing in most of the Great Lakes. This can be seen by the green and blue trend lines on this graph, which is showing data from two different buoys on Lake Huron. Lakes Superior and Michigan are seeing similar trends. Closely linked with surface water temperatures is ice cover. Ice cover is important on the Great Lakes for several reasons. Late season ice can protect fish eggs from predation. Less ice cover on the lakes can contribute to more evaporation of surface water, which can lead to more lake effect snow. Ice cover overall and for each individual lake has been decreasing over the period from 1973 to 2015 with an overall loss of 26%. Lake Superior has seen the highest total loss. Precipitation, surface water temperatures, and ice cover all have an impact on water levels. Water levels vary considerably on each of the Great Lakes with changes taking place over a variety of time scales ranging from hourly fluctuations to those taking place over hundreds of years. This means that the trend assessment can also vary depending on what time period you're looking at. For all of the Great Lakes, it's difficult to say whether there is a discernible trend over the past 100 years. In this graph for Lake Michigan Huron, considered as one lake by hydrologists, the green zone is showing a 30 year trend of decreasing while the red zone is showing an increasing trend for the recent five-year period. We're focusing on the 30-year trend, or the green zone. Even with recent water level increases and all of the Great Lakes being at or above their long-term averages by the end of 2015, the 30-year trend for water levels in Lakes Superior, Michigan, Huron, and Erie is decreasing. Despite the trend found in the last 30 years of lake level data, it's not yet possible to say with any certainty how much of this is due to the longer term climate change trends and how much is due to the natural fluctuations in climate. The long term impact of climate change on lake levels is unknown and climate change has the possibility of raising, lowering or not affecting lake levels compared to the last 100 years. Lake Ontario is a different situation with water level variability impacted by regulation of the outflows. In general, the variability has been reduced for the past 50 years compared to the pre-regulation period. The 30-year trend for Lake Ontario shows no significant change in water levels. In all, five sub-indicators help to determine climate trends in the Great Lakes Basin. Climate measures are telling us important information. Data are showing increasing amounts of annual precipitation, increase, increasing summer surface water temperatures, reductions in ice cover, and water levels are generally decreasing over the past 30 years. Overall, the lakes are responding to a changing climate, and these changes will impact other parts of the ecosystem. So the indicator for this general objective has two components, climate trends, which we just heard about, and watershed impacts. We will continue our story with the watershed impacts compo component of this indicator. The Great Lakes region has undergone dramatic changes in its landscape over hundreds of years, as well as the addition of millions of people to the basin. The Great Lakes region is home to almost 39 and a half million people, and humans have an enormous impact on the Great Lakes and the surrounding lands. Various sectors, including government and private agencies, are developing policies, certification programs, and education campaigns to promote promote sustainable living. Rural and urban best management practices are promoting sustainable use of the lands and protection of the natural environment and water quality. 
To assess the land-based component of the watershed impacts and climate trends indicator and to monitor progress towards achieving this objective, there are six watershed impact sub-indicators. We will highlight four of the sub-indicators in this section. Almost 60% of the Great Lakes population resides in the Lake Erie and Lake Ontario basins. It is projected that the population of the Lake Ontario Basin will continue to grow, in particular on the Canadian side, where an additional 3 million people are expected in the Golden Horseshoe region of Western Lake Ontario by 2031. Human activity is the main reason behind why the landscape in the Great Lakes Basin has changed over time and will continue to change. Overall, the status of watersheds impacts is fair and the trend is unchanging. Let's look at what the science from the sub-indicators is telling us. Starting with the forest cover sub-indicator, years of research and monitoring have shown that an increase in forest cover improves water quality. Some watersheds have experienced large land use changes due to agricultural activities or urban and suburban development. Increased forest cover within a riparian zone or land along the lakes or a stream can help reduce the amount of runoff from the land and reduce nutrient loadings and other non-point source pollutants. Areas with higher riparian coverage, as represented by green on the map in the northern portions of the basin, will likely have water quality that experiences lower stress. In other riparian zones, less forest cover suggests a higher threat to water quality, as shown in red on the map. Although urban and agricultural lands are important to the Great Lakes region because they help support us and our economy, the water quality in these, these areas is more susceptible to impairments or threats. The overall status of forest cover is fair and the trend is unchanging. There are large variations in land cover across the Great Lakes. The Lake Superior Basin is predominantly forested and the Lake Erie Basin is predominantly agriculture. Forest and agricultural land uses are more evenly distributed in, the, in Lakes Michigan and Ontario basins. This large variation in land use among the lakes reflects the underlying climatic and soil types across the Great Lakes Basin. Land use near river and lake shorelines can have a great impact on water quality. Substances are typically transported from the land to the Great Lakes via tributaries, so tributaries can be a source of nutrients and contaminants to the lakes, which can impact water quality. The status is elevated based on the amount of land, oh, I'm sorry, status is evaluated based on the amount of land in certain land cover types. The overall status for land cover is fair because approximately 50% of the Great Lakes Basin is agricultural or developed land, which falls within the assessment criteria for fair, and the trend is unchanging. Shorelines are sensitive to land use and water level changes. Shoreline hardening is generally implemented to stabilize shorelines or protect infrastructure from erosion and flooding. Past high water conditions resulted in more shoreline hardening activities. An overall assessment for hardened shorelines for the Great Lakes is not possible at this time. However, updated information is available for the Lake Ontario shoreline. Lake Ontario has approximately 30% of its shoreline in a moderately or heavily hardened condition. And we are seeing a trend towards increased overall shoreline hardening in some areas. The status for Lake Ontario is poor and the trend is deteriorating. The relative amount of stress imposed by four measures of human activity on the land was assessed for all of the thousands of tributary watersheds surrounding the Great Lakes Basin. These measures are population density, road density, urban development, and agricultural development. Red on this map represents the high stress areas, while green represents the low stress areas. Much of the southern part of the basin, which is underlain by rich soils and naturally supports deciduous forests, 
has been developed for agriculture or urban dwelling. So it's not surprising to see a higher stress area in this part of the basin. The northern part of the basin remains largely undeveloped and has a lower relative amount of stress. The overall assessment based on these measures is fair and the trend is unchanging. So this slide summarizes the status and trends for the six sub-indicators which comprise the watershed impacts indicator. Taking these results together, the watershed impacts assessment is fair and unchanging. Moving on to the habitat and species indicator. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement general objective states that the waters of the Great Lakes should support healthy and productive wetlands and other habitats to sustain resilient populations of native species. The Great Lakes are an amazing ecosystem that support a rich diversity of fish and aquatic communities. They require different habitats for survival, including rivers, streams, marshes, and wetlands. Human development, pollution, and invasive species can destroy or degrade these habitats, and as a result, impact the food web and, of course, fish and wildlife populations. The encouraging news is that there are many programs in place to support on-the-ground action to restore drained, degraded, or lost wetlands in the Great Lakes Basin. This work is helping to improve water quality and habitat for Great Lakes fish, birds, and other wildlife. The Habitat and Species Indicator uses 16 sub-indicators to assess it. While this may seem like a long list, the, eco the ecosystem is complex. Species are good indicators of habitats and how the food web is functioning. Today we will highlight some of the sub-indicators used to assess habitat and species. The state of habitat and species across the basin is quite variable, ranging from good to poor and improving to deteriorating, depending on the lake basin and the species of interest. The health of the species in the Great Lakes is also reflective of the availability and condition of the habitat that they dwell in and need. The overall status of habitat and species is fair and the trend unchanging. Let's look at the science from the sub-indicators that supports this assessment. We'll highlight three sub-indicators that are components of the aquatic food web. We will speak to phytoplankton, diparia, and one top predator fish species, lake trout. Phytoplankton are a vital food web component, and changes in type and quantity strongly impact the health of organisms further up the food chain, including prey fish. In turn, prey fish support the predator fish community, including lake sturgeon, walleye, and lake trout. We'll start near the bottom of the food chain with phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are a critical food resource for zooplankton and small fish. Lake Superior and Ontario are in good condition. However, slower long-term changes that are not yet well understood are occurring in these two lakes. Reductions in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are being seen as a result of invasive mussels which have negatively impacted the food web. The overall assessment for phytoplankton is fair and deteriorating. Dipariya, a small shrimp-like invertebrate, is another important food web component, particularly for prey fish. Dipariah populations are currently in a state of dramatic decline in all lakes except Lake Superior. Here, you can see the decline of Dipariah in Lake Huron. Note that the dark blue areas, indicating higher population numbers, fades over time from 2000 to 2012. Initial declines were first observed within two to three years after non-native Dracinid mussels first became established. This is shown in the bottom maps where the dark blue area expands, indicating increasing dracinid population numbers. Further work is needed to understand this relationship since future fishery needs depend on understanding changes in dipariah populations. The overall status of the dipariah sub-indicator is poor and the trend is deteriorating. Prey fish rely on zooplankton and dipariah as a source of food. In turn, Predator fish rely on prey fish as their food source in the Great Lakes. Lake trout is an iconic predator fish species in the Great Lakes. Self-reproducing and natural populations of lake trout are present in Lake Superior and in smaller populations in Lake Huron. Populations in Lakes Michigan, Erie, and Ontario are mostly below Great Lakes Fishery Commission target levels for abundance, 
with low natural reproduction. However, lake trout numbers are increasing in some lakes, as seen in this graph for Lake Erie. Stocking and other rehabilitation efforts are supporting some lake trout population increases, leading to an overall improving trend for lake trout. As part of the habitat and species indicator, we track six coastal wetlands sub-indicators. Wetlands, often termed Earth's kidneys, are vital for the health of the Great Lakes Basin. They cleanse impurities in the water and provide critical habitat for amphibians, birds, and fish. But pressures from agriculture and development, along with the introduction of non-native species, threaten the health of all Great Lakes habitats, including coastal wetlands. Despite the fact that coastal wetland restoration and protection efforts have improved specific areas, wetlands continue to be lost and degraded. Efforts to better track and determine the extent and rate of this loss are currently underway. However, coastal wetland habitat in some regions of the Great Lakes are still supporting a diversity of wetland species. The state of coastal wetlands across the basin is quite variable, ranging from good to poor, depending on the lake basin and the species of interest. We'll now give you some highlights from the six coastal wetland sub-indicators. We've seen improvements in coastal wetland fish with recent work showing an average of 10 to 13 fish species per coastal wetland. Some wetlands have as many as 28 fish species. Unfortunately, invertebrates, birds, and plants in coastal wetlands of some lake basins are showing a deteriorating trend. In the southern lakes, almost all co coastal wetlands are degraded by nutrient enrichment, sedimentation, or a combination of both. An additional stress in Lake Ontario is that the water level controls limit natural variation. However, in some of the more northern parts of the Great Lakes, intact, diverse co coastal wetlands can be found. One of the disturbing trends is the expansion of the invasive frog bit, a floating plant that forms dense mats capable of eliminating submergent plants in the coastal wetlands of the lower lakes and Lake Huron. Although coastal wetland bird and amphibian species have experienced long-term declines at various scales in the Great Lakes Basin, both are showing more, uncha more recent unchanging trends. Another sub-indicator is aquatic habitat connectivity. It affects fish communities in the Great Lakes. In Lake Michigan, for example, approximately 83% of tributary stream habitat is unavailable to migratory fish due to the fragmentation caused by dams and barriers. In addition to limiting access of fish to spawning and nursery habitats, loss of, aquatic loss of aquatic connectivity impacts nutrient flows and riparian and coastal processes in and around wetlands and other habitats. Many of the dams on the Great Lakes tributaries are near the end of their functional life and will need to be replaced or decommissioned in the next decade. This could prove beneficial to restore access for walleye, lake sturgeon, and other native fish. <laughs> However, Improving access for native fish could also result in increased habitat for sea lamprey and the spread of other aquatic invasive species. The overall assessment for aquatic habitat connectivity is fair and improving. The summary of 16 indicator assessments for the habitat and species indicator are shown here and on the next slide. This slide focuses on the coastal wetland components of this assessment. And this slide includes the native species component of the assessment, with a few species being highlighted in the presentation. Based on all of this information, the status of the habitat and species indicator is assessed as fair, and the trend is unchanging. Moving on to the invasive species indicator. The Water Quality Agreement General Objective states that the waters of the Great Lakes should be free from the introduction and spread of aquatic and terrestrial invasive species that adversely impact the quality of the Great Lakes. Harmful non-native species, also known as invasive species, continue to have a large impact on the Great Lakes. Since the 1830s, invasive species have entered the Great Lakes and have significantly changed the ecosystem. They have altered food webs, impacted water quality, and degraded habitat. Invasive species have also affected the people who rely on this ecosystem for food, water, recreation, and commerce. 
The overall economic impact of aquatic non-native species on the Great Lakes region is estimated at well over $100 million annually in the U.S. Various management actions are underway to address this issue by way of preventing new introductions and managing those invasives that are already established. In order to report on progress against this agreement general objective, we use an indicator called invasive species and its four underlying sub-indicators. The status of the invasive species indicator is poor and the trend deteriorating. Invasive species are one of the greatest threats to biodiversity in the Great Lakes region. We'll hear more about this in the following slides. Starting with the Aquatic Invasive Species Sub-Indicator. Since 1839, 185 aquatic non-native species have become established in the Great Lakes Basin, and at least 30% have had moderate to significant environmental impact. The number of establishments has now leveled off, as shown here on the right side of the graph. No new species have become established in the Great Lakes in nearly a decade. This can largely be attributed to successful ship ballast water regulations. Shipping historically has been the greatest contributor to invasions in the Great Lakes, as shown by the big blue area at the bottom of the graph. However, there are other vectors of concern as well, such as those related to the aquaria, water garden, bait fish, and live fish trades. In recent years, some new invaders have arrived through these other pathways, but thankfully have not become established. However, occurrences such as this tells us that these doors need to be shut. Overall, aquatic invasive species sub-indicator is assessed as poor and deteriorating. The invasion of sea lamprey is considered one of the worst human-caused ecological disasters ever inflicted upon the Great Lakes. Sea lamprey, another of our sub-indicators, has preyed on fish such as lake trout for decades. However, through concerted control efforts, sea lamprey populations have been reduced significantly in most lakes. In fact, control efforts have reduced adult sea lamprey abundance in the Great Lakes from peak levels by about 90%. In Lakes Michigan, Huron, and Ontario, adult sea lamprey numbers are meeting the targets. Yet, in Lakes Superior and Erie, adult sea lamprey numbers are above the target, but have been recently decreasing. Lake trout, walleye, and other top predator fish are still a significant target of sea lamprey predation. Sea lamprey are an, imp an impediment to achieving critical fish, community, and ecosystem objectives. Control of this species will require continued ongoing efforts. Also, improvements in aquatic habitat connectivity and water quality could unfortunately open the door for sea lamprey to colonize new areas. Overall, the sea lamprey sub-indicator has been assessed as fair and improving. Another sub-indicator, Dreissenids, or more commonly known as zebra and quagga mussels, have populations that are presently in various stages of change in the Great Lakes. Quagga mussels have displaced zebra mussels in all areas beyond the nearshore and have achieved abundances that greatly exceed those of zebra mussels. In general, zebra and quagga mussel populations are stabilizing in nearshore regions and quagga mussels continue to expand in deeper waters. Wherever the mussels are established, they are a dominant component of the bottom-dwelling community. Dreissenids have outcompeted native mussels species in the lakes and have caused many ecosystem problems. This includes their role in the distribution of nutrients in the near and offshore waters of the Great Lakes. Overall, the Dreissenid mussel sub-indicator has been assessed as poor and deteriorating. Moving onshore, the terrestrial invasive sub sorry, the terrestrial invasive species sub-indicator assessment is based on five species of interest. Three plants, purple loosestrife, garlic mustard, and phragmites, and two insects, Asian longhorn beetle and emerald ash borer. 
All five of these species can have negative impact on the surrounding ecosystem, and most importantly, can impact water and habitat quality. For example, in Toronto, the emerald ash borer is wreaking havoc on the city's ash trees. In 2001, Toronto had 860,000 ash trees throughout the city. It now only has around 9,500. It is believed that the beetle might eventually kill off all the remaining ash, untreated ash trees. Loss of trees along a water body means that water quality will be impacted. A threat of the five, the threat of five inv terrestrial invasive species remains high and warming temperatures due to climate change may increase the habitat range for invasive species. Overall, the terrestrial invasive species sub-indicator has been assessed as poor and deteriorating. So we can't leave this section without talking about Asian carp, even though we don't have a specific sub-indicator for it at this time. Asian carp are a significant threat to the Great Lakes and include bighead, silver, and grass carp. Unfortunately, this year for the first time, a fertile grass carp was found on the Canadian side in Lakes Erie and Ontario. Quick and coordinated responses to these discoveries eliminated the immediate threat. On the U.S. side, Asian carp in the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal continue to get closer to Lake Michigan. However, the electric barrier is still between them and the lake, 30 miles downstream of Lake Michigan. The summary of the individual lake assessments for the four invasive species sub-indicators can be seen here. You'll hear more about aquatic invasive species and actions to prevent their establishment or spread tomorrow in the aquatic invasive species session. Based on these sub-indicators and the overall impact that invasive species are having, the indicator is assessed as poor and the trend is deteriorating. Next, we will look at the nutrients and algae indicator. The agreement general objective states that the waters of the Great Lakes should be free from nutrients that directly or indirectly enter the water as a result of human activity in amounts that promote growth of algae and cyanobacteria that interfere with aquatic ecosystem health or human use of the ecosystem. Algae occur naturally in freshwater systems and are essential to the aquatic food web. Phosphorus is a key nutrient for the growth of crops, aquatic plants, and algae. However, too much available phosphorus can lead to too much algae in the water. Human activities, including municipal and industrial wastewaters and agricultural runoff, along with climatic conditions, can lead to the development of algal blooms, which can be harmful to human health and the environment. In the 1980s and early 1990s, Basin-wide efforts reduced nutrient-related runoff and conditions improved. These efforts included the government regulation of phosphorus concentrations and detergents, investments in sewage treatment, and the development and implementation of best management practices on agricultural lands. However, with the recent resurgence of the algal problem and other changes to the ecosystem, the problem and solution are a bit more complicated. To help report on the status of the nutrients and algae indicator and to monitor progress towards achieving this general objective, there are four sub-indicators for us to examine and assess. We will highlight three of the sub-indicators in this sec section. Overall, the status of the nutrients and algae indicator is fair and the trend unchanging to deteriorating. Now let's take a closer look. One of our sub-indicators is harmful algal blooms, also known as HABs. HABs refer to toxic and nuisance algae. They can occur in waters with high nutrient levels. HABs can have detrimental impacts on the ecosystem, can negatively impact aesthetics, and can pose human health risks. Nearshore areas in Lakes Michigan, Huron, and Ontario experience nuisance and harmful algal blooms. A deteriorating trend has been seen in some embayments, shallower basins, or nearshore areas where data exists. HABs, particularly cyanobacteria, which can produce toxins, have become a major issue for the western basin of Lake Erie and have also been reported in Sandusky Harbor, Presque Isle, and in Long Point Bay. 
One type of toxin known as microcystin is the most prevalent form of toxin produced by cyanobacteria across the Great Lakes. Microcystin is a neurotoxin which can cause skin rashes and can impact drinking water quality. Increasing nutrient inputs, climate changes such as increased storm events, and invasive species such as dracinin mussels may lead to increased frequency, distribution, and severity of both nearshore and offshore algal blooms. These factors may also favor the predominance of cyanobacteria. The overall status of the harmful algal bloom subindicator is assessed as fair and the trend is undetermined. The next subindicator, nutrients in lakes, tells us important information about conditions in the lakes. That is, whether an area is nutrient deficient or whether it has elevated nutrient conditions. That it, uh, when changes in nutrient concentrations occur in the lakes, there are impacts that are seen in the ecosystem. In Lake Superior, offshore concentration levels are being met and conditions are acceptable. Presently, the problems of excess phosphorus are combined, confined primarily to parts of Lakes Erie and Ontario and Saginaw Bay and Lake Huron. As shown by the circles on this map, this data is from 2013 and 2014. Phosphorus concentrations frequently exceed desired levels in these areas and conditions are deteriorating. Additional nearshore areas also experience elevated nutrient levels. However, in Lakes Michigan and Huron and northeastern Lake Ontario, offshore nutrient concentrations have declined over time and are below desired concentration levels as denoted by the arrows on this map. Too little phosphorus is one reason there may not be enough plant growth and can, can result in lack of food to support the food web. Invasive dracinin mussels are complicating this relationship. You'll hear more about phosphorus loadings and targets in the algal blooms presentation later. The overall status of the nutrients in lakes subindicator is fair and the trend is deteriorating. Moving on to the, another subindicator, Clodophora, which is a type of algae. Clodophora impact the ecosystem because of nuisance amounts rather than the production of a toxin. Rotting Clodophora and any organisms trapped within the algae can cause a strong odor that may be confused with sewage. Dracinid mussels and nutrient sources have been implicated in the recent increase in this nuisance algae. Excessive Clodophora poses many problems, including beach and shoreline falling, clogging of municipal water intakes, and unpleasant aesthetics as well as economic impacts. Clodophora is broadly distributed over large areas of the nearshore regions of Lakes Erie, Ontario, Huron, and Michigan. The status of the Clodophora subindicator is fair with an undetermined trend. Overall, the status of the nutrients and algae indicator is fair and the trend unchanging to deteriorating based on the assessment of the four indicators as shown here. Moving on to the groundwater indicator. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement general objective states that the waters of the Great Lakes should be free from the harmful impact of contaminated groundwater. Being underground and out of sight is one reason that the importance of groundwater can be overlooked. However, it is important to note that the volume of fresh groundwater in the basin is approximately equal to two Lake Hurons. That's a lot of water underground. Groundwater can enhance surface water quality and quantity and provide essential aquatic habitats. However, groundwater can also be a transmitter of contaminants and excessive loads of nutrients to the Great Lakes. The development of best management practices by federal, provincial, state, and local agencies have helped in some instances to reduce contaminants in groundwater in the Great Lakes Basin. However, further adoption of these practices is required. It should also be noted that it can sometimes take, take years or decades for changes in land management practices to measurably impact the shallow groundwater. To help report on the status of the groundwater indicator and to monitor progress to, uh, towards achieving this objective, there is one sub-indicator, groundwater quality, for us to examine. There are limited data to determine long-term groundwater trends. The overall assessment for the groundwater indicator is fair and undetermined. So let's take a closer look. As noted, groundwater is an important component of water that enters the Great Lakes. 
This information focuses on the general status of the quality of shallow groundwater, which has the greatest potential to impact the quality of Great Lakes waters. Groundwater can become contaminated with various substances, including nutrients, salts, metals, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and other contaminants. Groundwater plays an important role as a reservoir of water that, if contaminated, becomes a continuing source of nutrients and chemicals to the Great Lakes. Chemical parameters such as nitrate and chloride can be used to assess groundwater quality and to provide information about the ecosystem health and potential risk to Great Lakes water quality. Nitrate is mainly from agricultural practices and chloride is mainly an urban contaminant as a result of de-icing road salt. Portions of the Great Lakes Basin that have had more intense development, such as areas within the Michigan, Erie, and Ontario basins, are generally assessed as fair, as seen by the orange areas on this map. Groundwater quality is generally assessed as good in the less developed areas, such as portions of the Huron and Superior basins. This slide shows the status and trend for the groundwater quality indicator, noting that there are some spatial gaps in data, particularly in the northern and western portions of the basin. Areas with contaminated groundwater are known in some parts of the Great Lakes. However, how the gr contaminated groundwater impacts and interacts with the water of the Great Lakes, in particular in the nearshore zone, requires a better understanding. Most of the shallow groundwater in the basin flows towards and will eventually discharge into the Great Lakes. This connection has many implications for water quality. Using ecosystem health guidelines to assess, the overall status of the groundwater indicator is fair and undetermined. You'll hear more about groundwater impacts on Great Lakes water quality in another session later this afternoon. Next, we will look at the toxic chemicals indicator. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement general objective states that the water, waters of the Great Lakes should be free from pollutants in quantities or concentrations that could be harmful to human health, wildlife, or aquatic organisms through direct exposure or indirect exposure through the food chain. Humans make lifestyle choices that impact the environment in many ways. The products we choose for our homes, the vehicles we drive, the medicines we take, and the personal care products we use and even the electronics we can't live without. These products require chemicals to manufacture them. A lot of these pollutants or toxic chemicals end up in the environment. Some of them break down while others persist and may be harmful to humans or other living creatures. These are what we call toxic chemicals. The problem is not new. Since the, the time of industrialization of the Great Lakes region, chemicals have been entering the environment. With the signing of the original Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in 1972, work began in earnest to restore the chemical integrity of the Great Lakes Basin, and we've made great strides. We will now turn our attention in this presentation to the State of Toxic Chemicals Indicator. To help report on the status of the Toxic Chemicals Indicator and to monitor progress towards achieving this objective, there are five sub-indicator reports. Today we will focus primarily on PCBs and PVDEs, which we will define later. This doesn't mean that other chemicals such as mercury aren't important. You can find out more about other contaminants by attending the Reducing Risks from Harmful Chemicals presentation later this afternoon. The Toxic Chemicals Indicator tells us that nearly all legacy contaminants, such as PCBs, have decreased over the past 40 years. Non-legacy compounds, such as PBDEs, have shown slow declines in recent years, although some replacements for these products are seeing increases in the environment. The toxic chemicals indicator status is assessed as fair and the trend unchanging to improving. The sub-indicators supporting the toxic chemicals indicator represent data from several long-term monitoring programs. These programs have been tracking chemicals in various media or pathways for years, and in some cases, decades. By looking at these sub-indicators, we get a good picture of how the lakes and the biota are responding to management actions for various chemicals. Monitoring legacy contaminants provides insight into how contaminants move throughout the food web. 
So let's take a look now at one of the several legacy contaminants tracked in the Great Lakes, polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs. Prior to being banned in the late 1970s in the US and Canada, PCBs were used in hundreds of applications, including electrical and hydraulic equipment, plasticizers in paints and plastics, and carbonless copy paper. Despite being banned over 45 years ago, PCBs are still being detected in the air, water, soil, and sediment of the Great Lakes due to their persistence in the environment and their presence in equipment and materials that were manufactured prior to the ban. The status of the toxic chemicals in Great, in Great Lakes whole fish sub-indicator is fair and the trend is improving. PCB concentrations in Great Lakes top predator fish have continuously declined since their phase out, yet they are still above the targets as seen in the left graph. Concentrations of PCBs in Great Lakes whole fish have decreased on average by about 80% since 1977. The status of the toxic chemicals in Great Lakes herring gull eggs sub-indicator is good and the trend is improving. We are seeing declining trends in virtually all legacy contaminants in herring gull eggs. Concentrations of PCBs in Great Lakes herring gull eggs have decreased on average by about 65% since the 1970s. The status for the atmospheric deposition of toxic chemicals sub-indicator is fair and the trend unchanging or slightly improving for PCBs. PCB concentrations are decreasing relatively slowly in the atmosphere. There are continued, em continued emissions from equipment still in use and in the waste stream. Concentrations of PCBs in air have decreased on average by about 60 to 70 percent since the early 1990s at rural sampling locations. The status of the toxic chemicals and sub in sediments sub-indicator is fair and the trend is improving. Recent studies are indicating a 30 to 40 percent reduction in PCB concentrations in offshore sediments across the Great Lakes since 1987 with the greatest reductions in Lake Ontario. The status of the toxic chemical concentrations in open waters sub-indicator is good and the trend is unchanging. While the long-term trends for many legacy contaminants show declines to lower levels, there have been occasional exceedances of water quality objectives for PCBs. Shifting away from the legacy contaminants, we'll now look at a chemical of emerging concern. Polybrominated diphenyl ethers, or PBDEs, are flame retardants that are used in many consumer products ranging from furniture and car interior upholstery to electronic casings. Average concentrations of PBDEs in whole fish were highest in Lake Ontario, followed by Lakes Superior, Michigan, Huron, and Erie. Like PCBs, industries have begun to phase out certain forms of PBDEs, and as seen in the left graph, improving trends are being seen in some lakes. PBDEs in herring gull eggs from six colonies generally showed rapid increases from 1982 to 2000, no further increasing trend from 2000 to 2006, and then declines to 2012. The short-term trends, or those over the last decade, are a mixture of some showing significant declines, but others showing no significant change. Atmospheric PBDE levels are showing declining trends at urban stations, as seen here, in the PBDE graph for Cleveland. Concentrations in urban areas are typically higher than in rural areas. The trends of different forms of PBDEs at different sites vary. The results of recent open water monitoring for PBDEs and other flame retardants showed higher concentrations in the lower Great Lakes. Alternative brominated flame retardants were detected, reflecting wide usage of these replacement products. In sediment, various forms of PBDEs have exhibited some exceedances of the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment sediment quality guideline values, particularly in Lakes Ontario and Erie. These flame retardants and their replacements are widely used in commercial products and are ubiquitous in the environment. It's important to continue risk assessment activities, monitor ambient levels, and track progress of additional management actions. 
The summary of the individual lake assessments for each of the five toxic chemical subindicators can be seen here. Although we are seeing some declines, concentrations of some compounds like PCBs and PBDEs continue to exceed environmental quality guidelines or objectives. Localized areas of highly contaminated sediment or soil, such as in areas of concern and hazardous waste sites, may continue to act as sources of leg legacy contaminants to the lakes. Residual sources of PCBs remain throughout the Great Lakes Basin and the world. Chemicals such as current use pesticides, pharmaceuticals and personal care products may represent emerging issues and potential future stressors to the ecosystem. Based on the sub-indicators, the toxic chemicals indicator is assessed as fair and the trend is unchanging to improving. Phew, lots of information, but we're getting there. <laughs> we're about the seventh inning stretch now, so here we go. Now let's look at the fish consumption indicator to see how toxic chemicals impact the fish we eat from the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement of General Objective states that the waters of the Great Lakes should allow for human consumption of fish and wildlife unrestricted by concerns due to harmful pollutants. What most of us really want to know is, can we eat the fish? As the Great Lakes region became industrialized and the waters no longer pristine, fish accumulated some contaminants found in the environment into their tissue. Some contaminants built up to levels in some fish species until they became unsafe to eat. So how do people know if they can eat the fish that they catch from the Great Lakes? State and provincial agencies monitor contaminant levels in edible portions of Great Lakes fish and issue consumption guidelines. The guidelines are issued to minimize exposure to contaminants and to reduce the risk to human health, work to reduce contaminants from entering the ecosystem will ultimately result in lower contaminants in fish tissue and fewer consumption guidelines. In order to report on progress against this agreement general objective, we use an indicator called fish consumption and its underlying sub-indicator called contaminants in edible fish. This sub-indicator focuses on contaminants in the edible portion of fish, so it's different than the sub-indicator that Jackie just presented. The status of the fish consumption indicator is fair, and the trend is unchanging to improving. Now let's take a quick look at the science behind this. Contaminants causing consumption restrictions of Great Lakes fish include PCBs, mercury, dioxins, toxaphene, and myrex. However, PCBs drive the majority of the consumption advice. As mentioned previously in the toxic chemical section, PCB concentrations in all Great Lakes fish have declined substantially since the substance was banned in the late 1970s. There have been overall declines of more than 90% in edible portions of fish in some cases, as can be seen on this graph but the levels are still above consumption benchmarks, and, and you can see that by the dotted red line on the graph. Further decreases are expected, but likely at a slower pace. The 1995 US EPA Lake Michigan Mass Balance Study predicts that PCB levels in four to six-year-old lake trout from Lake Michigan will have declined to a point where they can be consumed in unlimited quantities by 2035. Current data are tracking with this prediction. However, additional stressors such as invasive species and climate change continue to complicate the cycling of contaminants in the Great Lakes. PCB concentrations in fish tissue appear to be stable or slightly increasing for lakes Erie and Huron, and this may be due to changes in the food web structure. The summary of the individual lake assessments for the contaminants in edible fish sub-indicator can be seen here. The status of the fish consumption indicator is fair and the trend unchanging to improving. In general, we have seen significant declines of contaminant levels in the edible portions of Great Lakes fish over the past four decades. To circle back to the question I asked at the beginning of this section, the answer is yes, we can eat most fish from the Great Lakes as long as we follow the consumption guidelines. Moving on to the drinking water indicator. The agreement general objective states that the waters of the Great Lakes should be a source of high quality drinking water. 
What most of us really want to know is, can we drink the water? Water is essential to the human well-being. It's a necessity of life. We rely on treatment, treatment technology to ensure water is safe to drink. Municipal water plants treat the water before it reaches our homes. They also monitor it following state and provincial drinking water guidelines. Any exceedances are recorded, and in some cases, other actions, such as drinking water advisories in Ontario or do not drink orders in the U.S., are put into place to protect human health. Great strides have been made not only to improve water treatment, but also to the limit what goes into the Great Lakes. In other words, these actions protect our source waters. In order to report on progress against this agreement general objective, we use an indicator called drinking water and its underlying sub-indicator called treated drinking water. Although Ontario and U.S. state agencies have different ways of analyzing and reporting on the data for treated drinking water, both compare chemical concentrations in treated drinking water to health-based standards. Overall, the status of the drinking water indicator is assessed as good and the trend unchanging since the last report in 2011. Generally, the Great Lakes are a source of safe, high-quality drinking water. Now let's take a brief look at the information behind this. Let's start with the U.S. information. From 2012 to 2014, the U.S. population living in counties within the basin of the eight Great Lakes states was near 26.5 million people. Over 95% of these people were served by water supply systems that are meeting health-based drinking water quality standards. There are over 4,100 supply systems to serve this population. On average, 255 or 6% of the total water supply systems incurred health-based system violations. Next, looking at Ontario's municipal residential drinking water systems for 2007 to 2014, the test results have been grouped into three categories of parameters, microbial, chemical, and radiological. The percentage of tests that met standards was higher for microbial parameters than for chemical parameters. All radiological tests met standards 100% of the time. Overall, the percentage of tests of municipal residential drinking water systems meeting Ontario drinking water quality standards has remained steady between 99.8 and 99.9%. .9%. The summary of the assessment for the treating, dr treated drinking water sub-indicator can be seen here. Note that the information was not assessed for the individual lake basins. Overall, the status of the drinking water indicator is assessed as good and the trend unchanging since the last report in 2011. However, source water must be treated to make it safe to drink. Again, circling back to, the question, to answer the question I asked at the beginning of this section, we can drink municipally treated water from the Great Lakes unless an advisory or do not drink order is in place. So the last indicator to discuss is beaches. Don't we all wish we were at a beach? Um, the, the agreement general objective states that the waters of the Great Lakes should allow for swimming and other recreational use unrestricted by environmental quality concerns. What most of us really want to know is, can we swim at the beach? In 2014, over a thousand beaches across the Great Lakes Basin were monitored for the fecal indicator bacteria E. coli. Elevated levels of E. coli can result in beach advisories which are issued to prevent human health concerns such as gastrointestinal, eye, ear, skin, or upper respiratory tract illnesses. Sources of E. coli include wastewater treatment plants, runoff from the land after a heavy rainfall, improperly working septic systems, and even large flocks of seagulls. There are efforts underway to control some of the challenging sources of E. coli. In the Great Lakes region, we are fortunate to have many wonderful opportunities to swim or otherwise recreate in the Great Lakes themselves. It is important to continue efforts to keep Great Lakes beaches safe for recreational activities. In order to report on progress against this agreement general objective, we use an indicator called beaches and its, under, and its supporting sub-indicator called beach advisories. The overall status of the beaches indicator is fair to good and the trend is unchanging since 2011. 
Now we're just going to take a brief look at the information behind this. So to begin with, uh, U.S. and Ontario use different E. coli standards or criteria to determine when to post a beach indicating that we should not enter the water. The Ontario standards are more stringent and thus Ontario beaches often see more advisories. Looking at the graph of Canadian Lake Erie beaches on the left side of this slide, the percentages of monitored beaches open and safe for swimming from 2011 to 2014 has declined and is assessed as poor and deteriorating as denoted by the increase in red and yellow areas on the graph. However, monitored beaches on the rest of the Great Lakes are generally doing good. The graph on the right shows U.S. beaches on Lake Huron. The percentages of monitored beaches open and safe for swimming from 2011 to 2014 has remained fairly steady and is assessed as good and improving, denoted by the substantial areas of green and blue. Lakes Superior, Michigan, and Ontario have similar assessments. Overall, the percentage of monitored U.S. Great Lakes beaches that were open and safe for swimming during 2011 to 2014 is an average of 96%. Over the same period, 78% of monitored Canadian Great Lakes beaches were open and safe for swimming. The summary of the individual lake assessments for the beach advisory sub-indicator can be seen here. The overall status of the beaches indicator is fair to good and the trend is unchanging since 2011. To circle back to answer the question I asked at the beginning, in general, many Great Lakes beaches are safe for swimming and other recreational use throughout most of the swimming season. All right, you guys ready for the conclusions? <laughs> so you've heard a lot of information on the conditions of the Great Lakes and the stressors on them. This is a summary of the 2016 assessment of the status and trends of the indicators. These help measure progress in achieving the nine general objectives of the 2012 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. These assessments are based on the 44 sub-indicators, -indica many of which you heard about during this presentation. We encourage you to look at the State of the Great Lakes reports for additional sub-indicator information when they become available in 2017. So overall, the 2016 State of the Great Lakes is fair and unchanging. Throughout this presentation, you've heard about some things improving and some things deteriorating in the lakes. However, many are unchanging since the last assessment in 2011. Conditions in the Great Lakes in the 1960s and 70s were degraded. With much effort, we have achieved great improvements in the overall health of the Great Lakes ecosystem improvements that are expected to continue with continued efforts. Billions of dollars have been invested by the two countries to improve the health of the Great Lakes since the signing of the first water quality agreement in 1972 and to strive towards the agreement's goals. Policies, regulations, and programs have been developed to address the complex problems that have faced the lakes. It's important to remember, though, that the ecosystem is large and complex, and it can sometimes take years or decades for the lakes to respond to restoration activities. Using a comprehensive and consistent suite of indicators helps us to monitor progress over time. So what does this mean for your lake? Looking at all of the 44 sub-indicator assessments, the state of each lake is shown here. Lake Superior is assessed as good and unchanging, and Lakes Michigan, Huron, and Ontario are assessed as fair and unchanging. Lake Erie is assessed as poor and deteriorating. However, there really are a mix of trends within Lake Erie as we described earlier. This is indicative of a lot of change happening in the lake right now. You'll hear more about the lake-by-lake -lake information in the breakout sessions that are planned for later this afternoon. That's it. And that's it. Thank you very much, everyone.